Okay, so we are going to be going through approximately 20, 20 things based on the traditions of Ramosha Feinstein for the Seder night. As uh, many of those things, I spoke to uh, by Mordechai Tendler, his personal assistant for over 10 years, who took notes on the things that happened in the household of Ramosha. So that's, I think a lot of it is very practical. This will be one of the most practical halachic shiurim you can have in terms of the uh, night of the Seder. Okay? Get the premise? Very basic, very simple. And unfortunately, going to cut away with a lot of the chumras that the people have for many things. And um, it's not that Ramosha wasn't machmer. He certainly was in, in, in many areas. I'm just not going to cover those areas tonight. We can, we can come back and, and look for them later. But um, the first the first thing I'm going to talk about is the start time for the Seder. Because there's a famous rush that's brought down the halacha, and I don't really see anybody arguing with it, which is that we should start the four cups of the Seder after Tzaytar Kachavim, after nightfall, halachic nightfall, we'll call three stars. The problem with that is, is that it makes for a very late start for the Seder, especially if you have young kids and if you have elderly people. And I was trying to like find a tatarum for it in the year of COVID and I looked into it. Um, I didn't I didn't really deal adequately with it enough other than to say that halakhically it's very hard to argue on somebody who gets accepted. Even if you say, well, the Ramam doesn't say it, the Rift doesn't say it, so the Rush is one of three, so why do we have to listen to him? And there's there's arguments to be made, you know, like, why does he get to decide this thing that wasn't said in the Gemara? But the bottom line is, is that um, you got to kind of leave the Rush in its place, but work, work around, there's workarounds. So, for example, when I was in Australia, I was invited by somebody to help lead a Seder for uh, old, the biggest old age home of Australia, which supposedly had a thousand uh, people in it. I don't really think there was a thousand people at the Seder, but there were definitely hundreds and hundreds. It was very, it's not the biggest Seder I was at, but it was hundreds and hundreds of people. Now, the only problem with the Seder is that it started early. Um, it ended late enough that I remember it was a very far walk. It was well over an hour walk, and I had to walk over an hour to get back to where I actually had the actual Seder. The question really is, and I, I didn't even know at that point, I didn't ask for Shiloh, are these people being Yotze? Are they actually fulfilling the obligation for a Seder that starts well before Tzaytar Kochavim? It, it finished after Tzaytar Kochavim, but that was it. That was just the finishing. Definitely all the Arbacosos were, were not the, the, the first Two of the kosot were before. The matzah, I'm not sure. But maybe Atikomen, that's when it's, uh, that was already completely dark. So it turns out that for an old age home, you can you could maybe arguably say you could start to as early as Plaga Mincha, so which is again, that's the circumstance. So that's one thing. So there are heteran. You do want to make sure to eat the matzah at the very least when it's when it's sate. Again, when exactly it's sate, there's more lenient sh uh, shiurim about that, sh shitas about that as well. You could rely on the more lenient opinions of what sate are for, let's say, young children, for families with young children that are getting very antsy and are not going to be able to stay up to start a seder at, at 9.30 at night. So what you could do there is you could start the preliminaries and time it so that by the time you get to Kiddush, it's a little after Shkia. 
And that's what really you, that's what really people who want to involve their, their young kids and it should do. There's no, there's early, and, and therefore, so let's say we're talking about the candle lighting now is 706. So in two weeks, what it will be 7, 711 or something like that. So, so you might be able to, a little bit after Shkia would be something like 7, 35, 745. So a little bit after that, you could be Mako, and there's some shitas that have an early seit, and you'd be Yotze according to those shitas. So basically, you would you could sit, you could start the preliminary part of the stater, let's say 730 or even 715. And by the time you get to 740, you'll make Kiddush. But that way, if you only Davin Myrids at seven, at eight o'clock, and then do hollow at eight thirty, and then you know get home at 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 nine o'clock, and then begin the seder at nine thirty. Yeah, your kid's gonna fall asleep. So there are things you could do even with the rush in place that you could be yotzin, not according to Rabbi Tom, but according to the the Shulchan Aruch and the Gra and so on. So that was the advice on that front. Okay, that's number one. Again. We continue with number one into number two. What time can you dive in Marif the first night? You can dive in earlier. It doesn't have to be that you don't have to. There is no Indian. There are a few people who are Mahmoud to try to dive in after Chase in general, Chabad, for example. But if you're not Chabad, you don't have to do that. So you can dive in Marif earlier and time it so that by the time you get home, it's going to be seven o'clock or seven, seven fifteen, let's say. And you'll set up for the Seder. And by the time you make Kiddush, 745, you'll still have participation of your children. Okay, what about the second night? So the, the issue with the second night is not, there's two issues. A lot of people think, oh, well, you can't prepare for the first night to the second night. But you can dive in early. It's okay. It's okay. The thing is, what you can't do is you can't really do the Sphere of Saomer too early. So you got two choices there. One choice is you again you wait till a little bit after Shkia and you count the Omer then. And if you want to be Khoshish, if you want to be concerned for the stricter Shita, so one says is, so you can count again uh later without a bracha. Okay. Now, what about halal and shul? Is there any to say halal at a certain point? No, you don't. You can say halal. It, it can be earlier. That's not an issue. That's number three. Um, if you want to discuss something for another time, is why why does Spirsa Omadavka have to be when it's late, when it's dark out? But that's for another conversation. We'll get it after Pesa. Number four is we'll we'll skip to Haseba. So we're required to recline. For the four kosas, for the the matzah, the um, the korach sandwich, the the afikomen. If you can during the course of the meal, not strictly required, but if you can, what about women? Are they required to recline today? The answer is yes. And it's the, the Mordechai already says that uh, the, in our times, the women are considered important. I guess there was a time before the Mordechai. Mordechai is 800 years ago almost. There was a time before the Mordechai that, it was a, that wasn't necessarily the case in terms of how society respected women. But by the time of the Mordechai, the so women are important. Is what it was considered as it was always It was always a distinction between important women and unimportant women. So important women had certain powers and certain freedoms. So they acted like, like ah, they were they were free. They had they had more power, so they would they would reply. As society progressed, we gave women more powers, more prestige. So all women became important. Interesting, if you look, strictly speaking, I was looking in the Alter Rebbe Shukhanach, there seems to be a backsliding. First, he quotes the Mordechai and says, today, 
the women should recline because they're all important. She says, however, we see the minig has become not to recline because reclining today isn't the norm anyway. It was a, it's a Roman thing. It's not like a, it's not a societal thing. You don't go to the White House. And Obama or or Clinton or Trump or or I'm, I'm saying them all no 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 discretion here are you know lying down on some gold couch a gold toilet maybe but not a gold couch because that's not the way people show their their power or their pleasure it's just a thing they did in Roman times but it's interesting we carry on Roman and hug him <laughs> Jewish customs is, is more in touch with how ancient Romans lived than Rome is today. <laughs> because Judaism has this quality that we just, you know, we we take something and we hold on to it. We're not letting go. <laughs> right? So so they said, so why should we why should a, a woman as important as she is have to recline? But today women recline that was 250 years ago. Now women recline because once reclining is the way of showing when we've established now What's been forgotten by Rome itself, we reestablish that reclining is a sign of cheris. Understand? We reestablish that. So therefore, since women, now it's a reality, women are important. Now it's a reality that the way we show freedom and power is by reclining on Pesach, so women recline. Absolutely. Okay, that was number four. And in the house of Moshe. The women absolutely recline. Number that's number four. Number five is here's where we're going to get to the kulas, to the leniencies. What is a revius? Revius is a certain measurement. What the measurement is, it's up to debate. And here's a story, a controversy within the house of Ramosha Feinstein about what happened to Ramosha Feinstein's Kiddush cup. Fascinating story. So it's known that Reb David wrote a Sefer that one of the things that the Sefer talks about is how much Reb David Feinstein, the Moshe's son, how much is the shear of a revius? An important issue. And he has a pretty big shear. But Mordechai Tendler insists that the true shear of Ramosha was much smaller as testified by the size of the Kiddush cup that he had, that was approximately 3.1 ounces. And he feels, based on conversations with Ramosha and other factors, that Ramosha held that 1.6 fluid ounces is considered a robe revius, and which is a very, very small sear in today's the other smaller shear I heard was 2.1 ounces or three ounces, uh, but 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 just over one and a half ounces is extremely small shear. So okay, so that's now that's going. Uh, by the way, the Chavetz Chaim also had a small becher, and a lot of people thought they should hide those bechers because it looks bad for them, like you know. But really, they had a smaller shear. They didn't have the big measurements we have. So some people think it's it's a shear is three, three and three something ounces or four something ounces. So they end up with these big, you know, bigger, bigger cups. Uh, and we're going to talk about that soon. Now, number six is there's two ways to drink the cup of wine. One way to drink the cup of wine is to have most cups Let's say this cup is probably, what, about seven ounces? Okay. So one way is to drink a revius. So let's say a revius is 1.6 ounces. Definitely robe revius is 1.6 ounces, according to Ramosha. So you take, drink, you drink a little under two ounces, you're good. And the rest of the cup is full. It's full almost to the top. Okay, that's one way. But I got the Rove Revius. Another way is to drink Rove Coast. Rove Coast would be 51% of the cup. And the third way is to just knock down the whole cup. Now, which one did Ramosha do? Did Ramosha drink just the, the Revius, the Rove Revius, 
Did he drink Rove Coast? Well, his Rove Coast would have also would have just been a Rove Revere, so it wouldn't have been more because it's such a small cup. Or did he drink the full cup? So he actually drank the full cup. And that's not just a personal preference, although he liked wine. He was sweet. He liked the sweet wine. But it was the preference that's brought down in Shulchan Aruch as one of the preferred. Not It's not required, absolutely. But it's absolutely preferred, if you can, to finish the cup. Now, that's a problem. I remember one day, there was a guy who always came to Shul on time. I lived in Santa Monica. Not only did he not come on time, one particular Pesach morning, he came at the very end of the davening, which is very unlike him. He was always one of the minion guys. So I said, I was a kid, so I didn't know you don't ask people why you're so late. Do I do that now? <laughs> I went over to the guy and said, why are you so late? <laughs> he, said, no. he, said, he said, you don't understand. He said, we had like these mugs. We, we didn't have cups. We had these big mugs, like these like, 20 ounce mugs. And we drank each each mug 20 ounces. So 20 ounces times four. I said, we slept in. <laughs> right? So that's a problem when you have a 20 ounce. By the way, they have uh, wine glasses now that take an entire wine bottle in one glass. So imagine you're a guy who keeps the chumrah brought down to have the full glass four times, four, four bottles of wine. That's going to be some hangover. I mean, you might die if you're not accustomed to it. Not all of us will die, but some of us will get pretty sick from that. So what do we do about that? So there's there's that's that leads us to number seven, which is we already learned that the shear is much smaller than people assume it is. So really, the first thing you should do, what did I do after I heard this? You want to know what I did? I googled three and a half ounce cups. I got four. I got pretty close. I got a four ounce cup. Pretty. A remote also, by the way, Paskins, that you should really not use a disposable cup. You should use, that's why uh, it's good to have a baffer. Okay, so a lot of people didn't, a lot of people are very makel in that sack. That's one of the chumras of Ramosha. They said, we're not going to talk about Ramosha's chumras because he has chumras, but we're going to focus more on just the, the middle of the road here. Some people are makel and say, well, Ramosha was talking about probably a Dixie cup or a very cheap cup because when he was talking about it in the in the 60s, the disposable cups, they disintegrated after a couple of uses. Today, uh, disp uh, these disposable cups are not so disposable. They're they're hazardous for the environment. They're, they're, they're ruining our oceans. So this cup that I found, four ounces, looks like a, you know, those new step, it's called stemless wine glasses. Very elegant. It's made for, it's made for wine tastings. Where you don't get a huge, you know, a, a six ounce or eight ounce pour, you get a two, three ounce pour. So it's a four ounce cup and it's on sale. And I ordered like a hundred of them for the first Seder so that everyone will get their own little four ounce cup. So that's the first thing you do get the right cup. The second thing you do and is you do Maziga Sakos. Maziga Sakos means you mix. It used to be they would mix water into the wine. So it should be approximately 3% alcohol because the wine doesn't generally go above 12%, except for Benjamin's wine somehow. But generally speaking, they're, they're, they're finding that even ancient wine wasn't higher in alcohol. Might have, when they say stronger, it might have meant one of two things. Stronger than grape juice. Or a very light, maybe they, they they started making even lighter than it is today. Or stronger, meaning it was uh, heavier. They, they didn't put in the different the nitrates, the things we do to make wine come out more evenly and taste better. They didn't have those mechanisms, so the wine was harif. It had a certain boom to it. So they had to they had to water it down for many reasons. One is that was what they drank. Barbarians drink wine the way we drink today. The only people who are left in the world who even know this are people who learn Shulchan Aruch. 
<laughs> right? Nobody else knows. The historians know this. No one else knows these things. So what you really should be doing, and I, I did this naturally, is I was always mixing grape juice with wine to make sure I didn't get a, a bang knockout headache in the middle of the Seder. Because I didn't always have those four ounce cups. <laughs> And if you have, you know, you knock down three cups like this of wine, you're going to, you know, you're you're 14 years old. You got to start a bar mitzvah. I'm saying, I mean, you're going to get a big headache. So I always knew you got to you got to pace yourself and you put in some grape juice. So what you do is if it's, let's say, 12 percent wine, 12 uh, percent alcohol content in your wine, you mix in two thirds or th three quarters, three um three to one to make it about 3% grape juice. And if it's if it's 6%, you could buy a lighter version, then you do half and half. So by that, if you're doing that, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up getting 3%, let's either two ounces, for, which is which is a total of two times, two times, four is eight so you'll be drinking eight ounces it'll be like drinking an eight ounce of beer oh oh you don't have to but you can you can and a lot of people but a lot of people can't take a lot of people can't really drink that much wine, they're not used to it, and they don't have to. There's no reason to do it. In other words, if you if you would like, you like to drink wine without mixing it with water, grape juice, go ahead, please. But if you don't, it, it, there's no chiv at all to drink it in a way that's harmful when that wasn't even what Chazal instituted. That's not some hector. Meaning this is the actual way to do it. You want to drink like a barbarian? Okay, because they drink like a barbarian. But that's not, that's not. Alpi halacha, you, you, we're letting you because you enjoy it. You enjoy it, so go ahead, be a barbarian. But in Shulchan Archa, it says that's not really their cheris. That's not freedom. So that means if you're still sensitive to the barbarianism that we now practice, you, you didn't become a barbarian. Everyone around you is a barbarian. They're drinking all the straight up wine. And you know what you want to be like the Roman and Jewish, we're the same. In some ways, Romans and Jews in drinking things, we agreed. Okay, the rest of the world went the the, the Germans won. They won the war when it came to drinking. They won the war. Okay, but we are reminded that there's still Romans ways of drinking. Go ahead and drink like that. Okay. You want to drink like the Germans? I prefer that way. The Italians would be horrified. <laughs> like, really? We should water down the wine? They're like, the Germans were right. The barbarians were right. Okay. So those are two things you could do to mitigate the factor of having these massive, unnecessary hardships for people. Again, it depends who you are. You don't, meaning the average person who's well and healthy and has a, a good relationship with alcohol can can tolerate that. But if that's not you, there's no obligation to make yourself sick. The other thing is, if you are an alcoholic, then just drink grape juice. We're just assuming you're not alcoholic. And it's, it's a, you know, just drink grape juice. You can, you can also even dilute the grape juice to water it down if the sugar content of the grape juice is harmful for somebody who's sick. So there's really very few people, and only be somebody who's really sick in the hospital, who can't have dalicosis. Find some way to do dalicosis. Four, four, yes, yes. And that's not even full. It's really even half, or if necessary, just a, 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 a revius, rogue revius, which is, like we said, just over one and a half ounces. So really, if somebody is not well, they could have one and a half ounces of very, very, you know, light alcohol content or no alcohol content if they're if they're not well, and they'll satisfy depending on you know, how serious it is. Okay, so that's a little bit about. You see, a lot of times people don't know these things, so they end up with big headaches. 
Now, we're going to talk a little bit. I mentioned about drinking, giving kids to drink at the Seder. Now, again, I don't know what the... I can't, I can't speak authoritatively of what parents should do, but technically speaking, when you're bar mitzvah, you have a little bit of wine. Again, what does that mean? It means with all of the precautions of, that we already enumerated, 3%, two ounces, times four, equals it's a beer basically it's like giving a kid a beer their first beer after their bar mitzvah okay maybe not even that maybe what you do is you give them the first cup of wine is, is a there's a wine called hyven uh, you know it's like a six percent uh, wine you give that you give that to that half half hyven half grape juice and then you just switch over to all grape juice so you you're again it doesn't have to be wine but if there was ever a time to like turn your kid into a wino, it would be the four the four cups of wine. Now, God forbid to turn them into a wino. You would actually be teaching them to drink responsibly. You'd be very careful and meticulous that you didn't just let them keep pouring wine, even though it's sweet and stuff like that. And you would talk about the, the dangers of wine. And but but that what but it but but in, in a free society how an adult can partake of wine uh, in, in 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 certain limited sets. Again, make sure to get the approval. If you're a rabbi running a community seder, I wouldn't advise this. I would just say grape juice in your own home. If you're on a, in a, under investigation, I wouldn't advise this. If you're going through a divorce, I wouldn't advise this. <laughs> if you live in America, I wouldn't advise this. If you live in Israel, they have enough tsarists over there. I don't know what the local, ask your local rabbi in Israel. Okay, talking about kids for a second. Let, let, let's, let's, let's stop for a moment. I want to, I will continue with the ins and outs of what we should, what type of wine, red versus white. But let's talk about something very important, which is how we deal with children. Because the main focus of the Seder has to be the children. And it's either literally your children or figuratively, there's somebody who takes the place of a child. Even, even if you've got nobody but yourself, you have to ask yourself, like Manishana, right? That's the whole point of the Seder to add, to do things that are different, to get the child to ask. And uh, to quote Rabbi Brandwine, there are no answers without questions. There's no light without darkness. There's no redemption without exile. So that's the core of what we're trying to do, the atmosphere that we're trying to create in this kind of cosmic reactor that we're building or rebuilding is that perfect atmosphere to create a question that requires an answer, okay? And that's what the whole purpose of the Night of the Seder is. It's Kanha Ben Shal, Manishtana Halalazah. Here are the things that we're doing differently to get the child to ask. So because of that, that's what we started out really with this man, with the time to be sensitive. By the way, in Shulchan Aruch, it says, start the Seder early. Again, how early? That was the conversation we already had. But don't diddle down. In fact, in Ramosha's household, the Seder went relatively quickly. It was pleasant, but they didn't do the, the, con, the con, complex during the Seder. There might have been a vart, short little nugget, but the complexity was reserved for the dinner itself after the Seder. Okay. Now, what do you do with little kids? This would be, let's say, we'll start from ages three, four, and five. So the answer in the home, that is you give, you, you, you give them treats. 
Every 20 minutes, you give them a different type of candy. And it's based on the Gemara that said you'd give them like roasted nuts. You just engage them and make it exciting for them to come back around. So they're 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 up and it's this thing. It's like there's a there's a little girl in the show that every time I see her, she tells me how late she stayed up for the Seder. Right? And she's what, four or five? Ever since she could talk, she's talking about how late the the Seder night was, right? So that's one thing you could do. So you could have Chocolate and jelly beans and and squishy candy and 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 of course there there's songs and you get them a little pillow and then they get a little older six seven eight nine ten you involve them a little more you you ask them to bring something that they did in school a coloring book arts and crafts they did a little dark Torah they have. Uh, again, also with the songs, obviously Manishtana, You don't you don't torture them too much with the Manishtana, but you, you you involve them with that, obviously. And then eleven, twelve, eleven and twelve. Again, I'm not saying this is for everyone, but you do give them the arbicosas. I mean, but you, you're always giving the kids when they're old enough four cups of grape juice, and then by the time they're bar mitzvah, you you you, you put in a little bit of wine. If you you know if you feel caught if it's that's okay, again I don't know if that's again within a super super measured way you're not nobody should be giving a, a kid you know a big cup of wine four times that's that's not what I'm talking about I'm literally talking about you could literally give uh, an ounce you know or half an ounce over the course of four courses that will come out to a total of two or two ounces, three ounces. As they get older, a little more, you add you add a little bit when they're 16, 17, a little bit when they're 19, you know. By the time I was 19, I was drinking more alcohol at the Seder night than I'm drinking tonight, you know. <laughs> I, could, I could process it better. It, was, it wasn't like my parents were plying me with liquor. I took They just didn't stop me. <laughs> that was enough. And obviously, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to really process. And we we came we came through our own Egypt. We had a Holocaust. And we we should talk about the miracles of being able to have survived the Holocaust. Meaning, I, I I didn't share it enough with my kids, but I had a grandmother who was in in, in a gas chamber three times. It, it didn't work, thank God. It's not like it worked, and she miraculously, you know, just just walked through the wall, Superman style. It didn't it malfunction, so I'm only alive because of that. The miracle of of three times a gas chamber not working. So what are the stories of of how we're each here? How how our how our grandparents escaped from the Holocaust if they're survivors? How they survived? If they got out, how they got out, how we rebuilt after homes and communities that we that we came from. So we should focus on the triumph. Of the Holocaust, how how we built Eretz Israel, how a, a, a group of people who were it, to, totally devastated and so many of them murdered were able to get back up, and a few years later have a, a place to a, a dream that was only a dream for two thousand years come to fruition. So when we're talking about the Seder. We could get into our own more current history, and then we could even talk about the whole darvadar omdim aleinu lachaloseinu, how they're still trying to destroy us uh, in in every generation on October seventh. We could talk about, for example, it says that the osano hamidstream. There's a great shot 
that says the Vyareya Osanu could be translated as the Mitzrim tried to make us the bad ones, which is happening in the world right now. The whole plot of Hamas and Iran, very effective, just as effective as October 7th. They knew what would happen, that, that thank God we have, we're not sitting in Nazi Germany, and we have a government that would protect us. And they knew that they'd be somewhat successful, and that, and, and the only way to do that is to employ military tactics that would inflict a civilian casualty, because that's inevitable, especially with the way they're embedded purposely in in that thing. I don't have to go through all of that, that, that conversation. But what's their goal? To condemn us in the eyes of the world to create more anti-Semitism, and they're getting that. And it's so much worse than that. They, they're turning one Jew against another. Because Jews are Rahmanim and Bashanim and Goma and Hasanim. Jews are compassionate people. So they can't take the idea that they're that you other Jews are inflicting harm and they don't want to believe that it's for purely military reasons. They want to believe it's for vengeance. Look, there might be a, a few people who want vengeance. Right? But it's not about vengeance. It's about it's about protecting ourselves in a very brutal area. That if you don't protect yourself, you know the consequences of that. The only reason why this didn't happen sooner is they're afraid of the consequences. Well, now they're suffering the consequences. But if we hate ourselves because the whole world is hating us, then we have to start all the way back in Egypt. Where we are. Behold, dar, but dar, and every generation, they're ready and they're risen up again the same way they've risen up in every generation. I don't know the reason. Jealousy. They hate God, maybe. Maybe they just hate God. They hate God, so this they can't they can't say anything against their own religion. Who was that who said they hate God? Hitler. We are God's agents, so if they think they can get rid of us, they could get, get rid of the world's conscious. That's one of the reasons. Look, there wouldn't have to be all this thing in the Middle East if they didn't know how effective it would be. How much people already hate Jews. How it would fall on such open-ended, you know. If they knew that people would have no, yeah, 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 you know. Okay, so that's a little bit. And if you're a liberal and you can't talk about Palestinians, so then talk about how the Palestinians are the ones in Egypt. Okay, that's the only half joke. <laughs> if that's what helps you, you know, do a Palestinian Seder. Maybe that'll help you understand. Look, there, there's, there's totally, there's, there's, it's, for sure, there's one of the, mo it's, it's the place in the world with so much suffering. Absolutely, the fact that it's self-inflicted, that they, that, that they, they invited the people or created, created the chaos. That's part of the problem. Also, it's a cycle that they are, are clinging on to. We would love to let go of the cycle. I hope so. Unless we, unless we're the ones, we can't. No, we, we don't like peace. I'm saying that facetiously. <laughs> We're peace-loving people. That's the problem. If we weren't peace-loving people. They would be. They wouldn't mess with us. Okay, so that's a little bit about we got to deal with today. We got to make it relevant for today. There's a million things that would make it relevant today. The main thing is listen to your children. The main thing is hear what's going on. In the, world. the main thing is a deep time not to answer until there is a question. So make sure you're hearing what the question is so you can answer the question. That's the key. Okay, next question. A little less subtle. Red wine versus white wine. So the answer, my friends, is if they're equal, the red is preferred. It's so sad. You know why? It says, except Oh, well, there's there, there's a there's a verse that 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 indicates that red has a preference, but 
it's brought down in the Shulchanan, except in a place where there's a blood libel. Then it's okay to have a big wine. So sad, you know, that that's in our code of law. I have to mention that. It doesn't have to be Mavushal. If you have a reason for it to be uh, it doesn't have to be non mavushal If you're in a situation where it would be less comfortable with non mavushal wine, get mavushal wine. Big a big uh, easy way to enjoy more. Uh, if you happen to like white wine, and I particularly started liking white wine a lot. It doesn't mean I don't drink red. I don't enjoy red. I enjoy white equally. Some is better than 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 red. Get a get a get a white and have a cup of white if that really will make enhance your seder. If that's really what you want, if you really want it, go ahead and do it. If you're doing it to save five dollars, if you really can't afford it, okay. But if you can afford it, spend the five dollars, spend the ten dollars more. Like no, so then if she loves it, then you get it. It doesn't have to qualify as a red. Meaning, now one thing you don't do is you don't blend. You don't make, because it's a rich night. So I don't say, I like a white wine, but I want it to be red. I'll put in some red. I'll make it red. No, if you want white, enjoy the white. You want a rosé, enjoy the rosé. By the way, before I was being very makele in terms of the amount of the alcohol, the size of the cup. But what? But let's say somebody is the opposite. They need a good wine. They need, they're not skimping on the quality. They're not skimping on the alcohol content. And they're okay with a with the eight ounce pour four times. Okay, then get what makes you happy. Okay. Now, just one thing. The first Revius should be drank, um, you know, without tiny sips. It doesn't have to be gulped down. The first Revius. So again, the first 1.6 ounces. You 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 swallow it you you drink it and swallow you don't tiny sip it afterwards you can enjoy you can sip a little bit by the way there's one thing I forgot I want to say about um, about carpas okay but we'll, we'll get that we'll get to the carpas soon so number twelve should somebody else pour your wine. In the Shulchan if it's brought down, somebody else should mix your wine. Talking about mixing. Uh, but pour, even if you don't mix, you just pour, somebody else should pour it because it's a way of showing that you're an important person, you're a free person, like having a butler who pours your wine. Uh, obviously, if you, if you can afford a, a, a butler, and if you have non mavush, if you have non mavushal, you have a Shomer Shabbos butler. Okay. He's got to do his own seder. By the way, there were, there were big, I remember the Chabad Siddur. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, the biggest Chabad seder in the neighborhood was on uh, Gailey Avenue in Westwood, Chabad of Westwood. And and there would be just the staff, and many of them were Jewish, and the staff was like 40 people who would run, you know, who, who would provide all the food and and. and service so one of the rabbis would have a seder for the staff after the main seder right so yeah yeah schwartzy okay number uh 13 can you drink wine during dinner if you had not, nothing particularly in mind when you made kids let me explain to you what the question is it's, first of all, you shouldn't drink wine between the first cup and the second cup. I'm going to get into the reasons why, but it, it, it creates a problem because it just does. <laughs> what about between the second cup? Second cup is the is the kiddush that you're going to right afterwards make mochi matza, marar, and so on. Can you can you drink wine during the dinner? And the answer is yes, you can. But it's brought down the Shulchan Aruch that now it used to be that when you made Kiddush, you covered all the drinking you'd have during the dinner automatically. But then it's brought down that at a later stage, people didn't drink as much. So if you wanted to cover all the drinking later, you had to have in mind that I'm going to be drinking later as well. And then you wouldn't have to make an additional Haggafen during the meal. That's brought down Shulchan Aruch. But the answer is no. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anything in mind anymore. It's it's 
it's it's self understood in today's day and age that we serve wine at at pretty much any occasion, any dinner, any yunt of dinner. There's going to be wine there, whether you had it in mind, you had nothing in mind. You are good to drink wine during the dinner without you without a hagafa. Okay, just drink it during the dinner. Now, number fourteen, where we get to, uh, we we're talking. We, we didn't talk about carpas when you dip a potato or celery, some do an onion into. Did I hear somebody do watermelon? No, <laughs> <laughs> into salt water, right? I don't know. It's probably making it up. So there's the, the shita of the Rambam, and there's the, the shita that we do. The Rambam says you should do a shira of a kazayas. We do less than a kazayas. The reason is the whole, there's no real necessity to eat it other than to get the kids to ask questions. So it doesn't need to be a, a kazayas. The problem is a lot of people are hungry. The Kalbach Shul we put out some potatoes. They want to have like, you know, five potatoes. So our minig is not to have more than a kazayas, but what you could do is you could wait five minutes. You could have a little bit of a potato every every five six minutes. You just you just don't have them all in one in one you know swoop, and then you'd be covering that as well. And there are some people. Well, even I think Ramosha might have also, after dipping in water, maybe the second time, put it put dip in a charosis as well. Very interesting, Menach. And some is brought down that you could, you should in Shachonach, that you should be Mechavin, that you're going to be Yotze, the, the, the Racha on the Mara as well, Adama. You're not making a second Adama when you eat Mara. You might think, why would I? It's covered by the Amotzi. But again, not for now. It is necessarily covered. So, by ha when you make the hadama on the karpas, have in mind that you're that you're not going to make a second hadama on the mara, half hour, an hour, two hours later when you have after you. Because again, the karpas is before the agada. The mara is after the agada, after ma matzah. Okay. Don't worry if you didn't get that. It's okay. No. Because it's. Because the truth is, today, in today's day and age, we just assume Amotzi covers everything. If you learn Gemara, it doesn't always cover everything, and that's one of those things that may not technically cover for whatever reason, because it's not part of the real meal, let's say. Think of it as like a dessert, right? So it's not covered. No. For a different reason, but the same uh, principle. Number uh, 15 is really a discussion about how to order the Seder plate. Um, in this case, there's there's different sheetas about how to order it. There's the Gra's version that that's how Ramosha did, or a modified version of the Gra. I'm not going to explain it right now because it's too late. And there's the Arizal, which is very popular today. That's what I do. The Arizal's custom of how to order the Seder plate, but it's brought down in Shulchan Aruch that it has something to do with Ema Vir and Alamitzvos. Ema Vir and Alamitzvos has something to do with like not passing over a mitzvah, which is strange. Like like we don't want to insult. This food over that food, the whole thing, right? So kind of like similar to to why we cover the matzah, but not not the same, but similar, right? Why we cover a challah or, or making kiddush. So Ramosha's custom was if that's the whole reason why we made the the Cairo with things that set up the way they are, so then have some respect and actually when you eat. The different things make sure to eat some of it from the actual car so there's a custom for example a lot of people don't know this to have an egg for in memory of the chagiga after you've eaten the, the matzah and the kara and dip them so we dip it in salt water so use the actual egg that's on the on the seder tape on the on the kara okay the one thing we don't eat is anybody who don't know what we don't eat from the kara the shank bone because that's roasted and a custom amongst Ashkenazim, at least, I don't believe Spartan have the same thing. But we don't eat roasted chicken or meat because it, it might somehow be similar, somebody might be confused of the roasting of the, the Pesach offering. A little bit of a stretch, but okay. Spartan don't have it. I don't know if they're they don't have the hang up that we have with it. 
I mean, there's easy ways of doing it. You add a little liquid to the to the to the pan. Put some schmaltz in. <laughs> okay, got to finish up here because Meyer is in a minute. I just noticed. And should everyone have a seder plate? It's number sixteen. At a public seder with like ten tables of the kava shows. No, we do it. But really, only the seder leader really needs a seder plate. Number seventeen. How much more? Um, okay, a kizayis. We'll get to that later. Now, number more importantly is how much matzah. Okay, here's what's wild, wild, wild. I, I, this should be a shirt of itself. But Moshe would do everything he needed to do on the night of the Seder with one matzah. Now, there's three requirements to eat, plus a little bit during the meal, maybe. One is when you have mozi matzah the first time. And you're supposed to eat two kazasim. Now, many people think a kazayas is half a matzah or a quarter of a matzah. So two kazayas is a little over half a matzah. According to Ramosha, it was probably more like a fifth, maybe a fourth of a matzah. Okay? You want to be machmer, a fourth of a matzah. Ramosha didn't have measurements. Ramosha, the way you should measure it is with your eyes, not with like, not with rulers. But you should, I mean, but you should educate yourself beforehand to know what a, what a kezayis is. So basically, you think of a, a matzah, and you're going to have a fourth of it when you make the first two brachot of hamotzi and alachilas matzah. And then you're going to have a slightly smaller amount for the hillel sandwich. It could be a, a, a sixth because it doesn't need to be two kazesim. It could be um, one. And then again, for the apikomen, it could be... Um, also, to two kazesim, which could be a fourth of a matzah. So, a fourth of a matzah in the beginning, a sixth of the matzah for the kara sandwich, a fourth of the matzah at the end, and it leaves you a little bit during these are tiny, tiny shiurim. This is a big coolest. This will save you a massive stomach ache. <laughs> okay. It's worth the price of admission for this. And with that, we're going to conclude and uh, break for Myra. Oh. Uh.